Welcome to our third panel of the day. This is messaging, what we say and how we say it. Our moderator for today's discussion is the brilliant Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. She has served as Director of Strategic Communications at Citizen Engagement Laboratory, as a consultant to the Democracy Alliance, and as Vice President at Women Donors Network. She is now the co-founder, Vice President, and Chief Strategy Officer of Way to Win. Please welcome Jennifer Fernandez. Thank you so much, Kala. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Messaging, What We Say and How We Say It. I'm very excited to be hosting this session of Definite All-Stars, um, and we're, we'll just get right into it. Um, I want to thank you, Kala, and the whole team at Field Team 6 for recognizing the importance of messaging and, and using it to register and, of course, turn out new Democratic voters. So let's go ahead and meet our panelists. It's it's amazing. We, we've all worked together for many years, in some cases, decades, and and so it's going to be a really fun uh, conversation. So first, I want to introduce Simon Rosenberg. Simon is the founder of the New Democrat Network, the New Policy Institute, lots of fans for Simon out there. Uh, the New Policy Institute is a liberal think tank and advocacy group based in DC. Simon has helped many Democrats win from Clinton to Biden. He's known to pundits in the world right now as the guy who got the midterms right. And he's joined Future Majority now and is launching a new substack that he's calling the Hopium Chronicles. Welcome, Simon. Our next panelist is going to be Tom Bonnier, a veteran Democratic strategist. He's worked in campaigns across all 50 states. Um, after he served as COO at the National Committee for an Effective Congress, he co-founded Clarity Campaign Labs, one of the nation's leading analytics and research firms. And of course, he is known as and known to us all as the CEO of leading political data provider Target Smart, frequent MSNBC commentator as well. Our final panelist um, is Terrence Woodbury, and Terrence has served in almost every position on almost every type of campaign out there. He was research director at Brilliant Corners Research and Strategies before working at the Brookings Institution. Currently, he's CEO of Hit Strategies and has appeared on CNN, The Hill, Bloomberg News, and many others as an expert on young, diverse voters and the best messages to persuade and mobilize them. There's, of course, more. Hi, Terrence. Welcome to you all. Um, there's a lot more info on their websites. I think folks are dropping the links in the chat if you want to learn more about these wonderful guests. And so um, to dive in as we get started, I think what we'll do is hear from each of you on the your sort of theory of the case, you know, top line um, kind of lessons or, or guiding things that you're that you take in your work around messaging. Uh, I will share some of mine at the end, and then we'll have a discussion and probably solve all the world's message problems in this one hour panel. <laughs> um, so uh, Simon, why don't you go ahead and go first? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks, everybody from Field Team 6. Tom, it's great to see you. And Terrence, um, it's going to be a great discussion. I, I just have two thoughts. I mean, this is such a big topic, and we could spend the rest of the day talking about this. But just two observations to kick this off. One is that I think we have to be as focused on the things that we do as the things that we say, meaning that, to me, there are three big things that we just have to do as Democrats, uh, Progressive center left people in the coming years. We've got to make sure that democracy and freedom prevail in the fight that we're in now. Uh, we need to make sure the planet doesn't warm. And we have to make sure that people's lives keep getting better. And so I think to me, our politics is going to be increasingly grounded in these conversations. And there's obviously within the democracy conversation, there's so much, right? I mean, it's a lot of what Jennifer talks about. I sort of use that in a very broad way. The second thing I think we have to do is become less uh, frustrated at the national folks running the, the enterprise and more focused on what we can do. I mean, I think what we've learned in the last few elections is that our powerful grassroots that's sprung up has been able to give our candidates so much money and so much volunteer time that our campaigns are more muscular and stronger than they've been. And we have this tremendous performance in the 2022 midterms, largely because of all of you and the work and money that you provide to the candidates we have. 
But I think we have to complement that with this idea of becoming louder and building new institutions and new organizations that are like this one that are out there doing the work, you know, to combat the, the right wing information superiority. But a key piece of that to me is what we do every day. I mean, I worked in the war room 30 years ago. And when you think of the war room, it's like 20 sweaty kids with Red Bulls, you know, producing videos. And we need to think of the war room now, I think, as, you know, two to three, four million people wired together, networked together, amplifying messages. We have to think about what we can do every day to fill up the positive space to make it harder for the right wing noise machine to push us around as they have so much we have to get louder. And so it's a combination of strong storytelling, narrative, arguments, and also being far more intentional and conscious about being louder and participating in the daily debates, not just focusing all of our work on campaigns. Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. Um, I love getting louder. I, I think that's a super mm -hmm. important part of how we do how we do this going forward. Um, so why don't we go to you, Tom? Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces here. Uh, thank you to Field Team 6, uh, both for the work y'all do um, to help Democrats win, but also for hosting this awesome event. Um, I will say up front, I am not a messaging expert. I, my entry point to this conversation is more from the data perspective and how that relates to messaging, which for me, and I'm not going to go entirely down this rabbit hole at this moment, I imagine we'll get there over the next hour or so. Um, the importance is being clear eyed and understanding sort of what's happening electorally and why it's happening and how it's happening, both, you know, more importantly, in the midst of the cycle. And I think we saw a lot of louder voices um, during this past cycle, which frankly weren't telling the true story of what was happening. And then I think even after the election, when we saw, you know, this, what was for many people a surprise Democratic overperformance holding the Senate, actually picking up a seat in the Senate, keeping the House very close, you know, historic wins in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania and elsewhere. And, you know, the immediate story that set in was a notion that ended up being false. And, you know, that's dangerous in my mind from a messaging perspective, because it colors the story of how did we win and what lessons do we take forward? There was this notion that, well, turnout was overwhelmingly Republican across the country, and yet Dem Democrats still prevailed um, and overperformed because they were able to appeal to a lot of Republican voters. And no doubt there were Democratic persuasion successes. But um, and this is something that Simon is, has been especially forceful in talking about this notion of the the dichotomy in this election um, is important to understand. So when we look at the messaging in places where we succeeded, in places like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, um, and elsewhere, um, you know, those are the successes that we have to lift up. And this notion of, you know, were Democrats talking about democracy too much? Were they talking about choice too much? You look at those places where those issues were at the forefront. And I have to say, Jen, I encourage everyone to look at Jennifer's Twitter and look at the pinned tweet because I have to give you credit. You have a thread from November 5th where you laid out the messaging that you and your team did, which is excellent, by the way. And everyone should read that thread because if you want to talk about messaging and you want to talk about what works, look at that. And someone who actually put it out before the election and said, look, this is what we're doing and what we're saying. And you look at that now, you say, well, gosh. That's when you look at where we won and where Democrats overperformed, it was following that exact playbook. So um, yeah, anyhow, but I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. And I will just, you know, reiterate that there was a narrative or a message kind of about the election that we were all facing and that you and Simon in particular with your interventions helped to shift. You know, sometimes we think there's just a message about, um, you know, getting out to voters about the issues, but there was actually a message about whether we could win and what was going on and what the biggest issues were that were driving people that your data work and Simon's data work really helped. To, to bolster and was super important. Can I jump in for one second? I'm sorry. Oh, I like hi, to, hello. Um, yeah, I, I'm Jason Berlin with Field Team Six. I like to introduce um, panels uh, while they're happening. I like to <laughs> interrupt them, kind of ruin things. And I'm sorry, I was a few minutes late. I just want to say uh, for anyone who joined after this got started right on time, which it should have, uh, welcome to messaging what we say and how we say it. 
and and thank you all for being here for this legendary panel of messaging all stars that I'm currently interrupting. Um, <laughs> last thing I'll say um, for for literally decades, as as you all know, people have complained the biggest failure of the Democrats is messaging that we regularly uh, regularly get handed our took us on a platter by the GOP who who march in lockstep. Um, you are all solving that problem right now. And we're fully aware that Field Team 6 is just one small corner of the resistance, but we're super proud to be getting your messaging out to millions of people every week, gen gar uh, uh, garnering you know, tens of millions of impressions every week and um, turning it into calls to action to register new Democrats. So thank you all. And thank you, Jen and Kona, um, for, for uh, you know, as Chief Strategy Officer of Way to Win for um, ch chairing this panel. All right, and I'm out. Back to you. <laughs> Thank you for that for that recap. Appreciate it. Um, so let's go ahead and hear from you, Terrence. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, Jason. Thank you to everyone here at Field Team Six for the work that y'all are doing for convening this panel and for this for I mean this incredible audience that we have here. My name is Terrence Woodbury. I'm a founder at Hit Strategies, and we focus on emerging on on the emerging electorate. Um, uh, also known as the bedrock of the democratic coalition, young people, people of color, women. And there's a, there's some squishiness happening. Well, this this is also where the greatest opportunity is. This, this is also where some of the greatest challenges are. There's some squishiness happening here. A lot of cynicism grounded in a healthy dose of realism. Reminds me of a young man in the focus group in Florida who said that his hood had not gotten any better under Obama or any worse under Trump. And so what do any of these presidents got to do with him? And that's a lot of the, that's the messaging that we have to solve for, that cynicism, that frustration, um, a lot of the splintering that we see happening with men of color that are becoming more susceptible to Republican messaging. Important to point to here, in the absence of effective democratic messaging, they aren't, it's not that they're hearing nothing. It's that they are only hearing uh, in, the, in, in the vacuum, they're hearing misinformation and disinformation. <clears throat> And so we have to do a couple of things here, um, and and look, we gotta we gotta get the words right. But more importantly, beyond just getting the message, uh, a message about making their lives better, we have to make their lives better. And I'm so glad that started there. <clears throat> Oftentimes, we are approached to figure out, you know, what's the right message to young people that we're making their lives better, or, or men of color. And frankly, it's got to start with making their lives better. And, and legislation doesn't always do that, right? This is another, uh, I swear the smartest things that, that we know don't come from us. It comes from these focus groups. It was another uh, young man in the focus group in, in Pennsylvania who said, Legisl winning legislation in Washington is only a win for politicians in Washington. And so unless we are connecting those resources back to them, when we needed their votes, we put in the palm of their hand, click here to find your ballot, click here to find your polling place, click here to get three of your friends to vote, click here to promise to sign Joe Biden's birthday card and promise to him you're going to vote. Well, now they need to click here to access millions of jobs created by the infrastructure bill. They need to click here to access, uh, to understand qualifications for child tax credits, or click here to access um, uh, uh, affordable housing vouchers, the things that they actually need, they don't get from legislation. They get from us delivering it to them. And so that's the first thing we have to do. The second is, is change the messengers. For a lot of the voters that we're talking about here, this emerging electorate, the cynical voter, the frustrated voter, they don't believe us anymore, none of us. They don't believe the politicians, even the ones they like. <laughs> They don't believe Barack Obama and he has a 90% approval rating. They don't believe that there is someone in Washington who goes to work every day to make their lives better. And so we have to reposition the hero and make them the hero of the story, not the government, so that this is about how their votes, uh, because they voted and because they stood together, we were able to, ch to pass child tax credits or because they stood together, we were able to appoint the most diverse court in history. And that's how we, that, and so before we even get to the, 
to the message, which I, frankly, I think that our message is, is, is pretty good. It's the messenger and it's the medium and how we're delivering the message that we also want to lean into in this conversation. Great. Thank you, Terrence, for bringing all that up. It's, it's all super important. And I completely agree and very much um, will hit on some of that when I, uh, on what I'm about to share. So I'm going to share my screen. I have some slides to, to show you all. And um, there we go. So messaging to win, this, these are some of my um, R at Way to Win sort of top foundational ideas that guide the message work we've done and some of the top kind of research lessons that we continue to take with us that are still really relevant um, even after 2022. So the first is our approach. It's very much data backed. We really believe in this idea of listening, deep listening to voters and especially across the entire coalition of voters, plus art and creative approaches that are different, plus science, how we evaluate how that works. And we've we've used this approach to create truly hundreds of ads. And then we really we look for the patterns of what works and see that in the data. And we use this approach in 2022 to great effect, uh, as Tom mentioned through a campaign that we called Protect Our Freedoms, a way to link democracy and abortion and other issues together to make it truly salient for the midterms. So our goal is mobisuasion. So we've heard about persuasion, we've heard about mobilization. We believe it's called mobisuasion because we really have to hold and grow this really diverse coalition. It's diverse in many ways, across ideology, across race and gender and generation. And so we look for this sweet spot of how we're mobilizing, how we're moving vote choice, and how we're actually amping up um, party favorability as well. This is just an example of one of our one of our better testing ads, just so that you can see what we're looking for in this data is that we're looking to move across the spectrum, whether you're liberal or, or conservative, you're actually moving your vote choice, whether you're um, black or API or Latino, you're more motivated to vote. This this doesn't necessarily tell us predict people will vote, but it gives us a sense of the is this message actually resonating with people emotionally, which is part of what we need to continue to do. Uh, and that I'll share just a quick example of, um, which I think is important of this ad that I just shared the data on, because we often right now are hearing um, the message has to be either kitchen table issues, you know, we can't um, touch on the culture war. Here's an example of where we actually did both um, an economic message that addresses some of the attacks the GOP is leveling on us. America is a country that works and works and works. But honestly, we're stuck. Too many Republicans and the corporations who buy them are making it harder and harder to get what we earn. They rigged the rules, and now they're trying to divide you by blaming immigrants or black folks or poor people. This November, vote for all of us. Vote Democrats. So um, the next point I want to make is that, you know, we a lot of ink gets spilled on the great values divide. But in reality, there actually is a lot of commonality when you really listen to the gettable voters we're trying to reach. They want a lot of the same things. Our friends at Avalanche call it pretty basic shit. And I think sometimes we forget that, um, and I hear Terrence talk about this a lot, it needs to actually connect with their lives. It doesn't have to be super fancy. People kind of just want basic shit. The second thing is that, um, we need to look at the party brand. It's important not just to look at individual candidates, but how is the party brand resonating with people? This is from studies we did last year where these are images people gave us about how they see the Democrats. And, you know, frankly, it's better than we anticipated when you look at the left hand side. It's like, that's great. You know, it's diversity. It's it's triumph. It's like getting to the top of the mountain. And the downside is what you see on the right, um, you know, feelings that we're disorganized, we're meek, we're kind of pleading, we're slow, uh, we're not really working at looking for the working class. The Republican on brand position on the flip side is quite toxic. I mean, we really saw this going into 2022. You see images of literally the devil, um, so much kind of fire and brimstone. This is something that we knew we could exploit and we did in 22. And we need to keep thinking about this for 24. But the one part that you see 
that is a danger is that it's where all the money is. People really see the Republicans as better at money, even though that we know that's not true. It's an important vulnerability for us. Um, and, and this is the other piece, which Terrence touched on too. People just don't feel the accomplishments in their lives. They, they say they don't know them about them, whether it's national black voters, Hispanic voters. It's an unbelievable amount of um, people who say they can't actually name anything that the administration has done to help them. This is a huge problem going forward. And then the other thing is that we found with our work, we could make a comprehensive argument. You know, we can touch on immigration, we can talk about gender and trans issues, CRT, crime and safety, all of these things that people tell you are, you know, these hot button issues you can't address. We actually found a way to do it when we leaned into what we believe and what our values are and really drew a contrast with the GOP and what they're really about. Finally, um, if your words don't spread, they don't work. This is um, something Anat Shankar Osorio, a dear friend and colleague of, of ours, says a lot, and it, it really is one of the tenets of our work. Um, and so in our work with Way to Win, we support um, hundreds of organizations that work in states and nationally, and we shared all of the research insights that we had with them. We shared the guidance, and they used it. We saw with Protect Our Freedoms and with other campaigns, over 800 groups kind of adopting that message, seeing an echo chamber created in a way that we hadn't ever really hadn't before. Um, and that, that also helped push this narrative out in the mainstream media with candidates who were using it in the organizing groups, you know, literature and the events they were creating. Um, and, and they actually used some of our best testing ads and adapted it for their own audiences. And so my, my final point um, is that we, you know, need to tell better stories than the fascists. I think that's something that we really feel strongly about. So we made this uh, particular ad in 2022, right before the election to tell a different story of what multiracial democracy could look like. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and play it. It's just a minute and a half long, um, but hopefully it uh, is a helpful reminder that we can actually tell our own story and win as well. America was founded on a dream of freedom, one that has yet to come true. It was freedom for some, freedom for the few, until we, the people, rose up and came together. From the Underground Railroad to Standing Rock, from Stonewall to Selma. We've pushed America towards that dream of freedom again and again and again. But there have always been those who use fear and division to cling to power. Now, once again, they are threatening to take away our freedoms, to control our own bodies, to vote and have the will of the people prevail, to love who we love. Progress often seems impossible. The truth is, we decide what's possible. You decide what's possible. We can build a country where all of us are free to thrive, a place where equality, justice, and liberty are real. And someday, when the next generation asks what we did in this moment to protect our freedoms, we'll be able to say everything we could. Hopefully, hopefully you all enjoyed that and you could see it. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and, and really embodied that idea of we need to give people a reason to vote, not just tell them, you know, not just tell them where or how, but actually why it's important. Um, so I think now we're, we get to open it up to conversation. And um, I think there may be some questions coming in. Uh, if folks want to flag me of questions, uh, the field 16, Field Team 6 want to flag me with questions that we should address, that would be great. But I'm going to go ahead and dive in and just start with, with you, Simon. Um, want to hear more about, you know, what you've launched this Strive for 55, the idea that Democrats should be getting 55% in elections instead of the squeakers we've been seeing, um, the extreme squeakers. So what indicators, what indicators are you watching, especially closely for that? Sure. Work. And kind of when we met uh, 15, 20 years ago, when you were when we were both much younger, 
You know, we already went through a process like this. I mean, if you look at, I have these amazing stats that I put together in this work I've been doing, which is from 1944 to 2004, we only broke 50.1% as a party one time in the 1964 election after Kennedy died. You know, Carter got 50.1, Kennedy got 50.1, Clinton got 43 and 49. Um, but in 1992, you know, we began this run of success, you know, of of improving our standing in the popular vote. When I went to go work for Bill Clinton, we had lost five out of the six previous presidential elections, some of them by enormous margins. And since 1992, we've won more votes in seven out of eight national elections. That's the best popular vote run of a political party in American history. And so, you know, first of all, you know, we are doing well in that regard. We are not behind. But from 92 to 2004, our average was 47%. And then something changed, right? We saw the emergence of this new electorate that Terrence was talking about, millennials and Hispanics. Many of us worked together to try to push the party to lean into this new electorate. And since then, when this new electorate emerged in the middle of the aughts, we've averaged 51% of the vote. That's a four point jump, right? From 47 to 51. And we've broken 51% now, three times out of three out of the last four elections. A remarkable showing it's the best presidential run we've had since FDR's presidency. It's my view now, though, that we have to try to imagine an even bigger coalition to get to 55. And we have to get to 55 to save our democracy, to save to ensure that democracy and freedom prevail, that we crush MAGA and break MAGA's dark hold on the Republican Party. And so I'm, I'm just trying to create a conversation around this notion of expansion as opposed to repositioning. And to go on offense, I think as was said by everybody here, Democrats have been operating to some degree from a defensive crouch. I mean, we're always overly cautious and we're not, you know, we have to learn, I think, just psychologically, how to be far more aggressive to go on offense, to have more confidence in ourselves, to be proud of what we've done, to be proud of who we are, to take our accomplishments to the American people and not allow the right wing noise machine to continually cause doubt, so doubt, you know, so doubt in our own understanding of ourselves and to push us around. And so very briefly, you know, there are at least four groups that I think, you know, there are eight, nine, but there are four groups that I think in the short term, we need to be really looking at. Number one is young people. You know, if we can get youth turnout up to its population distribution, we will, you know, put this election away and put the elections away for a long time. And, and we should, I think, not accept the idea that the people who vote the least are the most democratic. You know, the people who vote, you know, the people who are most supportive of us vote the least. We have to change that. And I think we need to launch a national registration and turnout campaign, persuasion campaign in the spring with huge amounts of money behind it and make it the number one political priority for us this year. But we also have to look at regaining the grounds that we lost to the Hispanics, and we have to look at rural areas. I mean, I lay out all these other ideas of other groups that we can look at. I don't know what the answer is. This is a little bit of a man on the moon kind of thing, right? We just got to go get there. How exactly we get there, there's going to be a lot of people with great ideas that can contribute to this process. But certainly, I think job number one is to increase our mark, you know, to increase the participation of young people uh, as we head into 2024. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that idea of expansion, it does relate to how we how we reach a broader group of the different voter co like parts of the coalition that we have to mobilize. So f with that, I would love to go to you, Terrence, just to ask you to talk a little bit more. Um, I know in particular, you've been looking at black men voters, but I know you're looking at the electorate writ large, but just like what are the fresher approaches that we need to be thinking about to overcome this pessimism and cynicism that you're seeing? And and how does that contrast with like the sort of business as usual? Yeah, you know, I think uh, Simon raises a really good point, especially with with young voters. And I'm, I'm going to come to men of color as well, but it's similar. A lot of the, 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 the prescriptions and interventions are similar because young voters have emerged as millennials and Gen Z in particular have emerged as the largest voting bloc in America and the least likely voters in America. And there is this perception that young voters are inherently more progressive, inherently more democratic. And while their ideology does seem to be, we still have some work to do in the messaging 
to not only mobilize, but to persuade specifically younger white voters who we have identified as voting a lot more like white voters than young voters. And the reason that, that it is perceived that this, that this younger voting bloc is more democratic is not because those younger voters are voting more democratic than their white, those younger white voters are voting more democratic than their white parents. It's just because there's less of them. There's just less white, young white voters. And so the diversity of this younger electorate is what's making it more democratic. <clears throat> But the ideology of those younger white voters still aligns. They still support abortion and marriage equality um, and climate change and gun control and these progressive issues uh, that, that Democrats have an advantage on. But we also have to lead with some of those issues. You know, for young people, the idea that uh, that we either talk, you know, identity politics or, or, or economy politics, it's they don't separate their identity from their politics. You know, this is the not only the largest voting bloc, but the most diverse vote, uh, uh, elect, um, diverse generation. And that diversity is a is a hallmark of their identities. And so we do have to lean in and win the culture wars. I hate the word culture wars because they don't exist in, in actual America. That's just, you know, on this Zoom and in our, in our political circles. Um, but we have to win them. Uh, specifically so that we could win this younger voting bloc. And the same is true for men of color more broadly, that, uh, that we have to find better ways of aligning our progressive issues with their most intrinsic values. And Anat says this all the time, you know, our policies are, un are, are, are unseemly. You don't lead with policy, you lead with values, you know? And so when we expect men of color who hold more conservative, social conservative values sometimes to go along with, uh, you know, we, with, with pronouns or, 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 or gender neutral bathrooms or marriage. Well, wh what is in this for them? And it can't just be because we said so. And there are values that do connect to that. Men of color hold very strong anti-discrimination values very strong protect your family and protect your children values. And they will protect their children from an, an overburdensome government in Florida or from, you know, uh, uh, legislatures that try to dictate, um, uh, dictate uh, the, the health decisions of their daughters. But we have to connect some of those. And we spend a lot of time understanding how to message, you know, Joe the plumber and soccer mom and these very, you know, uh, these different white personas, but we need to now figure out how to message to this emerging electorate in ways that connect with their values beyond just our progressive priorities. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Terrence. Um, Tom, if we could go to you next, you know, you know how to look at the data and not listen to just the pundits or the right-wing fueled media trying to tell us what's really going on. Um, I'm curious, as you look ahead to the next cycle, what are some of the indicators you're going to be looking for, you know, even if those are new things that we haven't looked at before? And how do you see being able to turn that into some useful messaging as we go into that uh, next cycle? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Um... You know, I, I think one of the big lessons and takeaways, and 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 hopefully this has sort of permeated the media consciousness too. I think it has, um, to some extent. We'll see. Um, there's been this obsessive focus on public polling and just the horse race public polling, right? Um, and maybe to the extent that they got into issues and messaging, it was in a very sort of one or two dimensional notion, right? We saw the discussion about. Um, economy versus choice and democracy as if it was uh, a zero sum, you could choose one or the other. And then in, in reality, we know after the election, uh, you know, to a point that Terrence made a moment ago that, you know, voters are capable of holding more than one thing in their head at a, a time and voters, including young voters are, are complex. Um, but there was this obsessive focus on the polling. There wasn't as much of a focus on actions that people were taking. And I think an important element as we consider the national messaging environment, we consider what's resonating and we consider 
you know, where we're investing and maybe where we don't have opportunities, we have to pay more attention to those actions people are taking. So what we're doing, what we did in a way, and again, Simon was an incredibly important partner in this throughout and really lifting it up more than anyone, um, is looking at the hard data points of where people are registering to vote and who's registering to vote, looking at primary elections, special elections, looking at first time voters, looking at contribution data, um, all of that information coming together. And then eventually the early vote data um, and looking at that and in the, the way that we've looked at it retrospectively. Now, now we can look back and say, oh gosh, what we were doing in Arizona and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Nevada actually worked. Being able to look at that more in real time is what we're doing resonating because we look at Florida now, right? As the sort of alternative to that. It seems the connection that we're drawing is not something that's that revolutionary or complicated. But where you had this perception of risk and you had a perception of opportunity together, you had to have both was where we were more successful and where we actually invested in communicating that. In Florida, Democratic turnout was awful. Youth turnout was awful. Um, there was a perception of risk there. I don't think there was a perception of opportunity and there wasn't that sort of investment to actually communicate our messages. So looking at more of that data in real time going forward, um, is also going to be incredibly important. Understanding that we have it within our abilities to actually change these behaviors, right? <laughs> like I talk about this as if, as if we're neutral observers, but in the end, you know, this is the work that we're all doing and that we can do. And so recognizing those opportunities, being smarter about them, thinking about places where we let the Republicans dictate the media environment, um, a lot of it driven by bad analysis. I think about the Wisconsin Senate race and Mandela Barnes and this notion that all of the stories there were about why was he blowing it? And was it because of crime? Was it because of inflation? When in reality, you know, that was a one point race, 25,000 votes, the media environment leading up to that didn't um, reflect that. And so again, had we paid attention to the actual data indicators there, we would have believed that was a winnable race. And I think the stories that that people in Wisconsin were waking up to every day would be different. And so, again, that's the sort of data that we'll be looking at and we'll be lifting up, hopefully being a little bit louder to borrow one of Simon's terms, to be a little bit louder and relying on, you know, folks like everyone on this call to help sort of create that echo chamber and share what we're really seeing happen. I love that. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so I got a question from the team on um, addressed to me around kind of what are the main attributes and all the research that we did that you really saw rising to the top in terms of being able to move people uh, and happy to open it up for y'all to share your thoughts too. I would say for us, there were really, there were really three things. Um, and it, it will address one of the other questions I, I saw pop in the chat too. The first one is just defending our own values and ideas rather than running from them or promoting conservative ideas sort of like triangulation is dead you know we don't need to do that anymore we can actually just take our own side in the argument because our ideas are really popular with the vast majority of voters so that's one two is really not give, letting the GOP off the hook. We were shocked in the early parts of 21 and 22 that how little voters were attributing the GOP to any of the things that they were upset about. It was it was kind of upsetting. So we have to name the GOP. We have to, and we called them the MAGA GOP because that was an important way to differentiate that this is not a, your typical Republican. This is a different kind of threat. The MAGA Republicans are not uh, something we can we can live with in our democracy. So calling it out for their obstruction, their extremism, their racial division, and then explaining why are they doing all of this? It's because their actual agenda is incredibly unpopular. Simon has talked about this a lot in terms of the economy is so much better with, when Democrats are in charge. We need to explain to people that all they're trying to do is get in power to give tax breaks to the biggest corporations and the wealthiest people at the expense of the rest of us. So ascribing motivation for why they are doing these things, not just saying that they're doing them, you know, really explaining that is important. It actually helps inoculate against all the culture war attacks. And then the third thing, which reinforces what something Terrence said, 
is we have to make the voter the hero of the story. And that that does mean um, leaning into this idea of cross-racial solidarity. Like we've all come together before across our differences to do big things. We can do that again. It actually, again, the, the white voters that we need to be part of our coalition, they actually, they actually like diversity. They actually want to be part of a multiracial majority. You know, we're not trying to get the super racist white people who don't want that. We don't need them to win in like all of these states. We, what we really need is enough white people who want to be part of this multiracial coalition. But if we don't name the multiracial coalition, then not everyone is seeing themselves in it and as part of the solution. And so that that's just the third thing that I that I saw in our work. But w would you all add anything to that, Simon, Terrence, Tom? I mean, I would, I would confirm a lot of what you said there, Jen. Um, you know, a lot of our, our work complements each other in, in, in beautiful ways. And so this declaring collective power and the power of that multiracial coalition, just saying it, we are powerful enough to make these things happen. We're together, we can, we can achieve the change that we want. But also to the beautiful ad that we just watched, examples of that power, mm -hmm. reminders that we've done this before, that it feels insurmountable but together we can. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and then and then finally giving, <clears throat> oh, I just lost the last one I wanted to add there. Uh, I, I'll come back, I, I, I lost my train of thought, but I, I do know that giving credit to voters and giving and making them the hero to your point, Jen, is, is it, it just goes a long way. Oh, that's that was the last thing. It's, it's knowing which voters we're talking to, right? We often try to find the, the broadest cross-cutting message, and that's always good for airtime. But we also have an opportunity to get very, very micro. We can we can do some micro messaging here, and disqualifying the other side is a disservice to the most cynical voters. Mm -hmm. they, they because they don't trust the process. Because the thing that they hate the most is the is the bickering back and forth. Just saying how bad the other side is does not win them into our coalition. Mm -hmm. Those are the folks we got to give them a reason, something to vote for, and not just something to vote against. Yeah, Jen, can I can I add because something that you said resonated with me with the notion of not running from our platform, right, and acknowledging that it's actually quite popular. And again, I alluded to this a minute ago, but I want to highlight this. You know, there was this discussion about our Democrats talking about choice and democracy too much during the election cycle, yeah. and you know, we had this wonderful very distilled, almost scientific example in Kansas, an election that was handpicked to be unfavorable to choice in the state in the time it was in early August in a primary when young voters wouldn't vote, Democrats generally wouldn't vote. And as everyone knows, the no vote, the pro-choice vote there won by 18 points, more than anyone predicted. And somewhere between one in three and one in four registered Republicans in the state voted no on that. It was an incredibly broad coalition. Younger women turned out at a higher rate than older men. It was the sort of thing that we generally don't see happen in terms of the correlation between age and turnout. I mean, what a perfect example in terms of the opportunity and, and, and the fact that the Republican extremist agenda is unpopular. It is an incredible liability for them, and we need to 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 lean into that. That by itself is not going to win us elections, to be clear. But we shouldn't be running away from it. And can I just add one thing? Just first of all, I think this has been a great conversation, and I'm really in agreement with everything everybody's saying. Um, but I think I think there is a mindset here about going on offense and expansion that is really critical to this because I, I think you know. When I when I give my talks, I always end by saying Joe Biden's been a good president. The Democratic Party is strong, right? We've made the country better. These sort of basic declarative sentences about how we've been a force for good and they continue to be otherwise. But we and we have to come to believe that, right? I mean, I think that so much of what has to happen for us right now is we have to reconnect with the greatness of the Democratic Party, the greatest political party in the history of the world. It's done more good for more people than any other organized group of people in politics, probably in all of human history. And I, in my presentation with Democrats, things get better, I go into that. But the key thing here is that it's not just about having confidence, it's that we have, we're now living in a moment of abundance as Democrats. They always had a lot more money than we did, and they were their campaigns were bigger, and that's just not true anymore. 
I mean, we're outspending Republicans in these battleground states by four to five to one at the candidate level. And our campaigns have never had the kind of money they've had. So when Terrence says we can both do the big message and also micro target, yes, we can do that now. We have enough money to do that now. We have the ability to actually run a campaign that can do both. We can show, we showed in 2022 that we can drive the early vote through the roof because of the muscular grassroots and because us leaning into it. There's so much more we can do now because of the money, our grassroots, who are people who are so scared of losing their democracy, losing their freedoms, have provided us that we have to get out of this mindset of scarcity and move to a mindset of abundance, going on offense, getting to 55, right? You know, being aggressive in prosecuting our case. And in part because they've left us so much room to go. DeSantis took himself out of this presidential election, in my view, in the last few weeks by moving so far to the right. I mean, MAGA, there is deep, powerful muscle memory against MAGA in the battlegrounds. They've had three bad elections in a row in the battlegrounds. DeSantis looked at all that and said, I'm going to go more towards that. I'm going to be even more MAGA than Trump. Trump and DeSantis have given us this ability to get to 55, to expand our coalition. Shame on us if we don't take advantage of it. Shame of us if we don't understand the opportunity to go big. I mean, Biden went big legislatively in 21, 22. We need to go pl big politically now, right? And really grow our coalition and, and end the dark grip of MAGA on our politics. The only way that's going to happen is if they get crushed in a national election. And that's why the tragedy of this last election is this, as as remarkable as it was, right? Like we did an extraordinary job, all of us together, you know, incredible work. Them winning the House allowed them to believe that maybe this politics will work for us in the future. And the tragedy of it delaying, in essence, the ending of MAGA, you know, by having them had three bad elections, that's why this election matters so much. The stakes in this election, they've been big in the last three. In some ways, it's even more important in this time. And it's really great to be here in the trenches with all of you. Thank you, Simon. I feel like that was a perfect dose of hopium that we needed. Right I'm all about hopium these days. <laughs> um, so there was a question from the crowd uh, about a couple of different demographics. One was Asian American voters and one was white women voters around, you know, any insights around messaging to them. Do you all uh, want to chime in on any either or both of those? I, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to speak. I, I have to say, in terms of the Asian American vote, you know, we think about the 2020 election. I like have to admit, as a white guy, to have been naive to the power of the API vote emerging in that election. And it was only when looking at the early vote, it was in Texas and Georgia, and it was about a week before election day. I just noticed in the early vote that more Asian American voters had cast a ballot early than had voted in the entirety of the previous presidential election in those states. And it was like, well, something's happening here. And I think people are probably aware of the sort of conclusion of that story. When you look at Asian American voters generally as the fastest growing immigrant population in this country, also youngest um, median age, have generally had also the lowest turnout. Um, you know, for lots of reasons. I've had the opportunity since that election to work with a lot of Asian American organizing groups and to hear more about the work that happened, the incredible work that happened. This wasn't something that happened organically. A big part of it was a response to Trump. Um, we also know that there, there, are, you know, something Terrence alluded to in communities of color in general, right? Republicans have actually invested and in, and in, and communicated with especially younger voters of color, and they've had successes, especially in the API community. So that's something that I, I don't want to set aside either. Um, you know, part of this also, and this is a whole conversation, is the broad grouping of API voters is not really well suited towards political analysis and organizing. The notion that there are so many differences from a data perspective, that set forth efforts that we're doing in terms of having data on nation of origin, generational status, language preference, things like that, because they make such a difference. We, we lump them broadly together as API voters, but we know there's significant substantial differences. So um, what we did see in 2022 was a little bit of a step back as we did see in many, of commu many communities of color where we weren't investing, where we did invest in places like Nevada and Arizona, especially we saw steps forward. 
where turnout increased. So, you know, I can't speak to the specifics of the messaging that worked some from a writ large perspective of the community, because I think there is such nuance depending on the community, depending on the state. But what I can say is that where we have invested, where we've looked at the data in a smarter way, where we've organized, we've had great successes um, with API voters. And when we look at this next presidential election, it's going to be so important in those states where we did take a step backwards to invest and to get back up to at least those 2020 levels, if not above, if we want, especially in places like Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, where the API voters are a huge share of the electorate. Yeah. Terrence, did you want to jump yeah, in? You know, I, I, um, I know my lane and uh, <laughs> and my, my business partner, co-founder of his strategies, Roshni Nedengadi, is both a woman and an API and an Asian American yeah. and, and leads a lot of our work there and has got some brilliant insights. One thing that she has been pointing to since 20 since the 2020 election that was also true in 2022. Beyond beyond just those two groups, that issues of race and justice have become ubiquitous across the Democratic electorate. They are not black and brown issues anymore. The entire Democratic electorate prioritize race and justice. Mm -hmm. um, full stop, right? And this is to, to Jen's point that we can lead with diversity because the voters that we need to win agree with us there. In fact, the overwhelming majority of Americans agree with us there. But, but also AAPI voters in particular were expressing the highest anxiety about racism um, because of issues that, 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 uh, that um, from, from the pandemic, from AAPI violence, from uh, incendiary rhetoric from the previous administration. And, all, and, and we saw that very profoundly in Virginia 2021 election, where we went and did focus groups at, after that election and heard AAPI parents expressing frustration about Democrats not responding more forcefully to attacks, uh, to CRT attacks. Right. And so again, we have to win these culture wars specifically for these for the diverse electorate that um, that feels represented, uh, even in issues that, that may not directly affect them. Yeah, I I echo that. I think, um, and and I'll say the slides that I shared and uh, that we also I also shared a YouTube link with all the videos that we've made that show some of this messaging in action, like on crime and safety. When when we make a proactive message about saying we all everyone deserves to feel safe in our communities and here's what democrats are doing for solutions and here's what republicans are doing just in action and just like listening to the nra and letting guns flood our, everywhere that message was most powerful with asian american voters mm -hmm. the violence gun violence is a huge concern so when we fail to actually make a proactive argument they will go to the GOP because the GOP is at least saying something to them about safety. It's not the right message, but it is something. And that that is a wedge that they've been using for Latino voters and API voters, probably white women as well. So it's just important for us to actually, again, say what we're for and make that proactive argument. The, the other um, issue that comes up a lot in both API and um, and Latino communities is also education. And that, and I think that resonates what you said, Terrence. It's like, we actually have to make the case for that we care about what's happening in schools too, not just ignoring it in the hopes that, you know, it's gonna go away. So I would say, um, and you know, with the work that Way to Win supports, we support a lot of state-based organizations led by different folks in the community, whether it's Latino or AAPI. Um, the other thing that is really big for us right now is how do we talk about economic renewal. These communities are aspiring, they're aspirational communities. They actually want an economy that feels like it's something where they can succeed. So that's just another message for us going forward into 24, that we, when we have an economic message that shows these parts of the coalition that they are in it too. And we're not just talking to like a small sliver of white working class voters. We're actually talking to this broad, you know, diverse community around economic renewal. That's another really important piece. 
So I know we probably have only scratched the surface. We could probably have this panel for like an entire day. Um, but I think we have reached the end of our time, unfortunately. Um, so I just really wanted to say thank you. Massive thank you to Simon, to Terrence, to Tom. You all are incredible. You're doing incredible work. So thank you for being here with us. And thank you to all of you for coming to the session. Field Team 6 for all the great work you're doing to get more Democrats registered. Very important to all of us. Um, and so with that, I will pass it off to Jason. Oh my God, thank you so much, Jennifer, Terrence, uh, Tom, Simon. Really, I, I'm just I'm blown away. Um, it's just so good to uh to, to to hear you talk about all these things i have a million more questions for you i love that uh, we have to tell better stories than the fascists i think that's a great goal uh we can do that we're smarter we're better they're not funny fascists are not funny um so uh yes thank you to this your, your, this whole dream team that is here uh we're super grateful for your passion and brilliance and we are some of your most dedicated end users. Uh, so as long as you keep on figuring out this, the best messaging and framing, we will uh, keep diligently pushing that out to everyone we contact and using it to register Democrats and win elections. So everyone on this call, if you are interested in spreading positive messaging and want to help, you can, and we absolutely need you. Uh, Field Team 6 holds social media storms that generate Currently, about 60 million impressions a week. They were up to, uh, uh, we broke, I don't know how many digits that is, but 100 million a week in the lead up to the 22 election. Um, and it, it's uh, just a huge digital megaphone and it's doing a ton of good. If you don't know what any of that means, impressions or social storming, that's okay. We'll teach you from scratch. Um, but spoiler alert, it's very impressive. Um, no experience is necessary. All training is provided. Just join one of our social storm trainings. Uh, and if you don't have a Facebook or Twitter or Instagram account, we can get you started. Sign up for a social storm at the link we're dropping for all our volunteer opportunities. We're dropping that in the chat now. And don't forget to also sign up for the newsletter. Check out our website and donate if you can to help us continue this crucial work. It costs us about $1.50 to register a new Democratic voter in a swing state, which is the deal of the century. <laughs> also remember, um, there is urgency to our work. Today, there are 19 days left until the critical Supreme Court election in Wisconsin, uh, in which the majority of the court is at stake. It will either stay conservative or if we can elect Judge Janet Protasiewicz, do the Protasiewicz blitz and get her on the court, we can correct the terrible situation in Wisconsin regarding abortion rights, voting rights, and gerrymandering. All of that can change with a new liberal majority on that court. So let's make every day count. Um, and now it's time for everyone to head back to the Zoom main stage for announcements and to choose your next panel. We have a whole bunch of fun still to come. There's super podcaster Brian Tyler Cohen, comic Paula Poundstone, New Mexico hero Congressman Gabe Vasquez, who flipped his ruby red district blue. We have super organizers, Sarah Jekyll and Jess Craven, newsletter writer, Robert Hubble, uh, world-changing entrepreneur and philanthropist, Whitney Tilson, talking about the time he just spent in Ukraine and how he's been helping the efforts to defend democracy on the front lines over there and so many more. So I'll see you on the main stage. Uh, this is amazing. Thank you all.